One, two, three. Hit it. America is going bankruptcy. It's really hard on living this economy. The people now see and they want to be free and the world is now saying, let it be, let it be. Tell you what, it gets it can get as bad as it wants. I'm gonna eat. <laughs> the economy can get so bad, nobody eats, but I'm gonna eat. <laughs> Office of President of the United States. Office of President of the United States faithfully. And will, to the best of my ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. difficult times that we live in. Worldwide, many people have lost their jobs in today's tough economy. Because of these lo job losses, everyone is watching what they spend. As a result, less money is being fed into the economy. This snowball effect has led to stores closing, increase of crime rates, and home foreclosures. There ain't no jobs. There is no fucking jobs. We have bullshit to your left. We have bullshit to you, right? This is, this is, this is fucked up. This is it. The, the last, the last 20 years, Americans have been told it. It's a scary world out there. Stay in your house. You feel what I'm saying? Don't come out here. Don't talk to anybody else. Stay in your house. And what that did was, you know, if I'm out in your, if I'm out in the streets, stealing everything out your yard. I want you to be terrified and stay in your fucking house so I can just walk up to the house and take it. You feel what I'm saying? Like, I don't want to have to like fight you for it. I, I want you to be terrified, sit in front of your Xbox 360, your flat screen, and watch cops in the news and all this stuff that scare you because people are out here crazy, they're savages, nobody knows what anybody will do. They're not really human and only your family is all you have to worry about. Just try to keep them from coming into my house, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you're like that, then I can just walk on your porch and take your swing set, you know what I'm saying? Your little troll in the yard, I can, you know, hell, I could take your whole front porch off. You're so busy hiding in the house, you know what I'm saying? Pull the bricks out from the sides of your house, your whole house be falling down. And, then, and, and what's happening right now is that we've been sitting in there playing PlayStation, surfing the internet, doing all these things, and now, the bricks is out of our house, and, and the house is starting to shake when the wind blow, right? And everybody's like, oh, shit. Wait a minute, it's the, what's going on with the foundation? You go outside, we finally, like, starting to peek out the windows and look, and we see a banker walking away with the bricks from the foundation of our house, right? You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, wait, you got my, you got my foundation, you know? But that's what's, that's what's going on, man. Like, and like organizing give you opportunity. Organizing is like, and you knocking on that door and saying, you know what? That dude across the street is stealing all your shit. You know what I'm saying? I, maybe you need to come out here. 
and keep them from stealing your shit. In general, I would first say that in Youngstown, we've kind of been dealing with a recession-like environment for about 30 years. The community has learned to cope with that and kind of like a survival type mechanism. The sky used to be covered with silk. Like just when you wake up in the morning, your car, no matter what you do, it was covered with black smoke. Instead of looking at that as like, oh my God, they're killing us, people were like, we're making money. It's, that means we're prosperous because we're producing things. There's probably <laughs> about 5,000 vacant homes in the city, and this is, we're talking about a city of under 70,000 people. So that statistic, when you look at it on a per capita basis, is probably the highest in the country. If you could have seen the city through my eyes years ago, you know, and that's what I try to give to Mario, the vision of what it was, okay? This was a very viable area. With organizing, what's, what's cool about organizing is that we're actually giving people opportunity to re-engage in social institutions, you know what I'm saying, and conversate with each other and come up with strategies and ideas for their own neighborhoods, you know what I'm saying, and not just leave, a, leave it in the hands of some quote-unquote expert. Because we, we, we've basically seen what the experts, <laughs> what they got us. In other words, I stay inner city by choice, not because I had to. I chose inner city. This is what I am. This is who I am. And I will always roll up my sleeves to try and make inner city a better place. I wish the money would go up, not down. We need money to pay bills. Lots of people are living in the streets because the bank took away their house. <laughs> like all these neighborhoods in Las Vegas have even in the nicest neighborhoods of Las Vegas you walk into them and they used to sell for five six hundred seven hundred thousand dollars and now every third house is empty how many people from California came over here and inflated the prices of Las Vegas that created the boom it created the big bubble that caused it to burst the United States is built on a foundation of home ownership and it's the pride of ownership it's it's having a place that you can call your own that is the basis of owning real estate. People turned it into an investment vehicle which completely altered how the equation should, should be seen. All right, so check this one out. This house right here is one of the stinky ones. Usually you come in and it's like, it kind of throws you back. Because I mean, you have people that, that, that are squatters that come in here. I mean, this carpet has just been sitting here. I mean, people come in here, pee in here. Um, they drink beer, they do drugs. When someone loses their house, it takes a long time for them to lose their house. I mean, you're in a house like this two and a half years before somebody actually buys it. This house right here, we picked up for $25,000. $25,000. How long ago did you guys pick this up for? Uh, just this week. Oh, really? I just told you that that house probably went into foreclosure a year and a half, two years ago makes you wonder how many more people are in the process of losing their house and what that's gonna to do to the economy. It's basic economics. We don't want these areas to become decrepit where you've got nobody living in the houses. They're like ghost towns. There's no community, there's no children out playing, there's no nothing. That is the greatest, it's like a bomb has gone off because there's nobody around. If we all get out there and have a positive frame of mind and still find a way to be able to help each other through this difficult time, that is how we're going to get to where it is that we need to be, period. California fires, high prices and the blue lights keeping me awake at night I can't control my head but there's a girl I've known come to me I would rather 
in for me. My name is Beverly Geis and I'm here in Newport Ritchie. Was in Gainesville just about a year ago. Lost my job there. Decided when I lost the job that it would be a good time to move. I've always wanted to live on the west coast, so of Florida that is. Always lived on the east coast. I don't know that it's where I want to stay, but um, you know, trying to get my business going so far, I haven't uh, succeeded at that, getting customers, and so it's very difficult to, to know if I'm going to stay here or not. And so here I am, thinking that I would get a job, um, nine months now, unemployed. It's very tough. I'm not alone, I know, so I accept that. I am attempting to pursue my um, passion, which is my business I created five years ago. She was eight years old at the time when I came up with the idea to offer tea parties to little girls. I have magic fairy dust which really gets the little girls all excited. I tell them to close their eyes and make a wish. Think of a wish that they want to come true and I'll sprinkle the dust over their shoulder or I use one of these little thingies. So I want you to close your eyes and make a wish. Me? Yeah. Okay. okay, I'll put this over your shoulder and hope that it comes true. A little luck for me, too. Well, she has obviously taken care of me my whole life. And while my dad was out working, he builds rides for amusement parks and museums, and he's an artist and set designer. So he travels. And my mom's just taking care of me in... You know, she's like my best friend, my sister. So, I mean, I've got ideas in my mind, but I also want to just, with it, things changing as they are in our world, I believe there's something out there that I don't know about yet, and I hope that I'll, by communicating as you and I are doing here, we'll figure out something and make a difference. Let's believe it, let's believe it, let's believe it, let's believe it, let's change. It's coming soon, no matter who you are. It can come any shape or form, it can come in a star. You know you might feel like you're the only one who thinks they're stuck now, but it's not true. Just know it's temporary. You know, so I was teaching at the university, but just not making enough money. I mean, especially in New Mexico, the teachers don't make enough money. So I started looking for other work, and the only work I could find was out of town. I miss birthdays. I miss Valentine's Day. So it's it's rough on me, and sometimes it gets rough on them. It's roughest. It's probably roughest on the middle one. I think she complains the most. Bad at the back. So we're just asking people how the economy affects their lives. Okay. It affects your life, you just don't know it. Wow. Say my dad's gone too much, that's yep. how it affects my life. See? I should be more stressed, in fact, my <laughs> wife used to get mad at me when we were really making no money and I was like, you know, it's gonna be okay, it'll work out. And she would get mad at me like, you need to be more, she would be more worried about it. Mostly I've just been uh, lucky with the people I've been around and, and patient and realizing that if it's not happening right now, then, then the right thing will happen eventually. Last year, I felt really fine and uh, the economy was really great, normal. But today, the economy is on recession, which means business industries have been declining. This caused jobs or other means of livelihood for the people to reduce. The government services become limited to very basic necessity because tax collection, which is the source of income for the government, is poor. Some cities in this country declare bankruptcy because of this recession. They know. I'm hoping they don't come down and like blow it up while we're standing there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there's a lot going on about this building right now because city council just is uh, 
tried to rush the, the tearing down of this building in the last couple days. And so there's a lot of media, a lot of uh, notice right now about this building and uh, the owner of the building. But, you know, it's been vacant for almost 20 years now, but it looks like it's probably been vacant, you know, since it's almost built the way that it's been kind of destroyed. I think it represents how big Detroit used to be and how mega, how much of a megatropolis it used to be, you know what I'm saying? Like, Detroit was straight up and is and always will be on the map. You know, this building is like, you know, a testament to that. So Detroit now, as you know, is, is uh, one third vacant land. It equals the size of San Francisco. And I, I take folks to this Packard plant. The Packard plant is uh, a former auto company. It was founded, this building, in 1906. While this is an expression of the pain, it's also, you can almost take a deep breath and say, this world is coming to an end, both as an empire as well as an industrial age. And Detroit is a very interesting city because it was one of the first cities to become deindustrialized and to become devastated. Michael used to employ, we employed approximately 200 people back in December of 08. And with everything the way it is, with nobody's making vehicles or anything, we are actually only down to, I think we employ a total of possibly 20 employees right now. If the auto industry fails, We've, we've definitely, will see the effects trickle down from everything, you know, to, to the body shops and the distributors and the vendors. So I think that it plays a huge part. And not only the millions of jobs that are out there. You know, when I come here before it got so terrible in Detroit, I made uh, good money. So that's what keep you in the plants with the money that you made. <laughs> and then, you know, you stay in it all these years and then it start to fall apart on you. Ain't nothing you can do about it. You just got to ride along with it and see what happens. And one of the things that Jimmy writes in the chapter on dialectics and revolution in this book is that the American Revolution is going to be different from other revolutions because it's going to require our uh, giving up things rather than acquiring more things. If you only see the buildings, I mean, the phrase we often use, if you, you only see Detroit with your eyes, you see one thing. But if you see it with your heart and you see it with, in the relationships that you have with people, of how people are struggling to, to create something new and something different, something that has human value and human meaning. So it's different, you know. Just, just maybe about three, four weeks ago, I actually came by here and periodically I like, will come back over to the neighborhood and like see, what was up or what's going on. You know, old neighborhood meeting, you know, when I was eight, nine years old. And just two weeks ago, I forgot that they were talking about closing down Cooper. And I was like, man, maybe I should roll by there to see, see what's up. All this used to be houses everywhere. This all used to be houses. So, this is Cooper Elementary School. Like, just like a, a bomb just came in, boom, and wiped out everything. This is like, just seriously, like, crazy. that's closed already, public schools, right now you're looking at, in the last three to four years, you're looking at almost 50 to 70 schools in the last three, and now they're saying in another 
two to three, they're gonna shut down another 50 facility. And if this is the, the destiny of all the rest of the schools, like really, you really don't think that the city's gonna come back if you're gonna allow this shit to happen. Cooper Elementary School, baby. Yeah, take over drill. Take cover drill should be take over drill. You need to take over. Can you get that? Yeah. I think, obviously, people start leaving, and then as everybody else is starting to leave, the school kind of gets less people in it, and it goes about anything else. It's like when you get a scuff on your brand new gym shoes, you see that first one, but then if you, after the days and stuff go by, you stop noticing it. And that's what's happening with Detroit. People stop noticing shit like this and not seeing it anymore because it's all around them. So now your new kicks that you have for, you know, a couple of weeks look like you didn't have them for a couple of months because you, you got scuffs all over them. Right now, I'm trying to get this job right here. Look, check this out. It's Nebraska Game Parks Commission. Nice, that sounds like a good job. It's, it's evaluating the fish on the Missouri River. Hey, I'll tell you someplace else y'all can go. The biotest place where people got to sell plasma. Because that's the only job around, man. Is that what you're doing right now? Uh, I've done it twice. I hate it, man. Uh, that's a plasma don donating center, and uh, you just, I don't know, sit there, and they get plasma out of your blood and stuff, and you get paid for it. I'm just wondering, like, how come you, you can get paid for giving plasma cells? Um, we're actually not paying you for your plasma. We're paying you for your time. Yeah, they said it only takes, like, two hours. I mean, that's 20 bucks an hour. Do you think people are just doing this for the money? Well, of course. <laughs> You can see Lincoln used to have a lot of money, man. Lincoln used to be a booming, cool town, man. Here's the teachers, students, here's Crystal. Please come to my office. I have an injury. Here's Crystal. Please come to my office. Thank you. 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 Basically, I'm here on the North Shore to kind of experience the country life. I think there's a huge difference between a house and a home. And people here strive to make a home. And there's a huge industry and a huge economy that's coming in here with their pickaxes, trying to divide that. Nobody's ever gonna strive to achieve less. But the perception of what more is changed for a long time. And the perception of more became attached to economics and money. And before, more was attached to family and community. I think I've always strived for living a simple, happy life and that I just have a mindset for. So you kind of create your own destiny. Life is all about connections. And the reality is, is that I think once you connect to something, you care for it. And once you care for it, you take care of it. One of the things that can help the economy is to bring back out bring back the outsourced jobs from overseas. This will help the citizens of the United States who lost their jobs. Talking about copper, all mineral metals prices are set on world markets.
as our consumers stopped spending and buying what China was selling, their economy suffered, so the price of copper and other metals fell very precipitously, causing producers in the United States, as far away as the US, as far away as Arizona, to adjust to that market. And suddenly the demand for copper just wasn't there. I worked from 1970 to 19 to 2005. Well, this place always a, uh, a copper mine. Yeah. From back in the days, huh? Back in the early 1800s. How many people work there? Well, there before the layoffs, about 4,000 people. Now there's 1,500 people. And they've cut production back by 50 uh, percent. They've totally shut down one of their mills. So yeah, this this town will definitely this county will be impacted. You know, I always go back to this analogy. Archimedes, this Greek philosopher, said, if you give me a lever long enough, I can move the world. It's, he was demonstrating a fundamental principle of physics. If the lever's long enough, I can move the world. He's right. Well, we don't have a lever long enough in the United States anymore to move the world. We used to, probably. Innovative and creative of you guys. Yes. So at least we're representing Orange County well. Oh yeah, that's that's good. That's good. Not not everybody does that. I'm not sure the Real Housewives do that, <laughs> for example. But uh... I think when you look at at uh, a mine closing down in Arizona, and then you come to Washington, it's, it's as if you're you're looking at the other end of the telescope. There's virtually no one, and no one in elected office, I believe, who thought this was going to get as bad as it's gotten, who foresaw everything that has happened was happening and had proposed before it happened something that would have solved it. Do you trust the government? No. No. No, no. Not at all. I asked the question by a question, should we? Good question. I've, have they earned our trust? Politicians here, they come and knock on the door. They come in and knock on the door, you know. Hey, can you help me? You want to vote for me? And I, you know, I tell them, well, we need some help in the neighborhood. Oh, we'll look into it. I'll look into it. I say the water's being wasted in the park. Nobody looks into it. There's water flowing down the road. Every morning, thousands of gallons. Can you have somebody look at it? Yeah, I'm going to look into it. The water's still the same. Nobody does nothing. It's not difficult for me to stay true to myself because, uh, I enjoy this job or I wouldn't do it. Uh, I believe that um, I get the satisfaction of making a contribution that I believe I'm making or I wouldn't do it. But I had a life before I was in Congress and I'll have a life after I'm out of Congress. So I don't constantly run around here scared to death about what would happen if I ever lost this job. I was the sixth child in the family, and I was born east of Granger, out in the country, on a hot July day, and I weighed 12 pounds when I was born, and uh, my dad and mother, my dad and my sister were going to town, and they couldn't figure out a name for me, and they happened to notice this Arvin name on a, uh, uh, on the knob for the heater. See that? What is that? And I saw that's what I was named after. I was named after the Arvin Corporation who made the Arvin heater and the Arvin radio back in 1935. fantastic to live in America. They're, you know, the opportunities are tremendous. 
And uh, what other country in the world do you have this, that you have a chance to invest your money and take the risk in order to make more money? I mean, that's, that's the most important thing. In Iowa, it's mandated that they put 10% ethanol into gasoline. Well, when, uh, what caused it? Why farmers uh, financed and built these ethanol plants is because corn was not profitable and they wanted another market. And that's what ethanol provided them. If you ask anybody today, what drove oil to $147? And you gotta understand, when they tied corn to oil, now they tied the number one food source and the food chain, okay? And then every piece of livestock, what do they eat? They eat corn. You can't give them anything different. I mean, there's, there's alternatives, but they're, you know, everything follows corn or oil. Other people probably think differently because they've got different occupations, but oil and gas drives Alaska, and in my opinion. The next 60 to 90 days will more than likely determine my family my immediately families, uh, it'll, it'll be a life, life changing situation. If we make it, life goes on. If we don't, it'll be a complete life changing situation. We got 140 employees here and all their families. I mean, the, the fallout, you know, of a facility like this is huge. Keep hoping, keep dreaming, it'll be okay someday. Keep Yay. hoping, keep dreaming, we can't carry on this way. I'm Francis Thompson. I was the oldest child in the family. I had one other brother, Roy. Uh, we were raised in the Texel Mill Village in Piedmont, South Carolina. Born May the 28th, 1928. And uh, that's your depression, some of your depression years. We have a credit card. And I've always told my wife I'm a divorcer, which I wouldn't, of course. She's a fantastic gal. But if, she, if we had to pay, a penalty for a late payment. I think it's a wonderful mechanism. It's a wonderful bookkeeping for me because on that credit card I get all the statements and so forth. Now I find out where my wife's spending money. Our, our grandson says, "Na na, and Tata, when 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 um, when I go and I play pro ball, huh?" He said, "I'll buy you guys a new house." We said, "Nope, we don't want a new house." Fix, we'll fix this one because it's never been fixed. We don't ask for nothing. We don't. Normal. And I said, we said, no, we're, we'll die in this house. And if I do ask for a dollar, if I ask you for a dollar, I'll pay you back. Otherwise, I won't, I won't ask you. For it. He's half Dominican. His father is a professional baseball player for the Dominican Republic. Wow, he's got good genes, huh? Oh, <laughs> wonderful genes. We're not rich by any means. Don't get us wrong. But what we have is paid for. And we've done it by scrimping and saving and doing without. If we, if we couldn't pay for it, we didn't buy it. 65 million years ago, it was a asteroid that hit this planet and killed the dinosaurs. That was an external cause. Our peril today is an internal cause. It's the way that we have lived. It's the way that we thought that we could use the resources of nature, use them up, not give a damn, that we could pursue economic growth, and that we could make money like crazy, that we didn't have to think about our relationships to each other. We appreciate life, uh, like, we're happy that we have a place to sleep and, and and we have enough money to eat. We don't care if we have luxury cars or we have millions and millions of dollars in the bank. We don't care about that. Is today a special day for you and Arvin? I don't know if he's thought about it yet or not, but <laughs> it is. <laughs> What's that? Is today a special day for you and your wife? Absolutely. What, what is it? This is our, uh, this is our anniversary. This is our anniversary one. She told me she was, uh, she loved me. <laughs> She was, many, she was stupid enough to become engaged to me. Fifty-three many, years ago. Fifty-three years. Fifty-three okay, years ago. Okay, just a minute. Okay, here it is. Okay, Happy thank you. Thank you, my dear. <laughs> Look at that. For my husband, always thinking of you. Big 
because there's something pretty wonderful about everything you do with love our, on Valentine's Day. That was fantastic, dearie. Appreciate that. Did you open it all up? Inside. You did all that. Yeah. Okay. And I want you to know that that is daily. Daily. There's enough of them there. Count them. Okay. You can mark them off each day. Is that right? That's fantastic. And why I say that is because, like, when I ask my dad for something, like, he says, oh, no, um, my nickname is Achi. So um, he's like, no, Achi, you can't get that now because um, daddy doesn't have enough money to get you that. And I'm like, um, all right, but, like, how come you can't, like, have the money? And he's like, because the economy isn't in good shape right now. I'm like, why isn't it? Because um, um, someone, so a special someone spent the money on armies and stuff like that. My name is Stedford McLaughlin. Um... I'm from Massachusetts, and I joined the Army three years ago when I was having a hard time finding work in Massachusetts. I just knew that things are not going good. Everything was slowing down, so, and I had an opportunity to come into the military, military where, I, where there was, I can get, a, I can make money, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I know I'm gonna get a check every week. I joined up, it was guaranteed paycheck, number one, and um, I was pretty much guaranteed that I'd have a job for a while, man, you know, for as long as I wanted if I want to stay in. So I moved back to Sonora, and I was working as a waitress, and it just, like, slowed down, and there wasn't money, like, waitressing is only good if there's customers. The majority of the people that are in the Army are lower-class people, middle-class, lower-middle-class people, you know, that... They joined for whatever reasons, mostly for money, for either college money or pay off loans or for just a steady job. And you're over there fighting and you all of a sudden realize that, wow, you know, it's pointless. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a good experience. And all the people I've met, I wouldn't take that back. I lost a lot of friends in Iraq, my first tour, and and Afghanistan, lost a lot of friends. Um, seen things and done things that, you know, required me to sacrifice a lot of my own morals and personal integrity, you know, in the name of the job. I feel like I've sacrificed more and given more and received nothing in return other than a paycheck. That's all I've gotten for it, you know? The objectives of this program is first to help the poor and needy, second is to foster self-reliance, and third is to um, provide service opportunities. This is where um, people, if they have a need for, um, like if they have children and they need a coat, um, they can re receive new clothes from this area. And this area is the Quality Assurance Lab. We have paid scientists who come here to test the product and the produce that um, the church produces here to make sure that it's of good quality and that it meets or exceeds the government standard. So this is the employment resource services of this program. As one of the objectives of the church, as we mentioned earlier, is that to um, help people help themselves as well. So here, um, people who come in here were able to find jobs, find a better job, or um, get the training that they really needed. With this economy, I feel that I feel that things got worse at one point, but I, but I know that it will get better at another point. It may not happen now, or it may not happen tomorrow, but I know it'll happen soon. If I had money, I'd buy a reliable car. Head west for Hollywood, be a messed up superstar. They'd even love me so much, I'd get my name on that boulevard. Make so much money, maybe to burn on a normal price house in those hills. Wasted away on pills and cocaine, friends of the day, no, it ain't my thrill. Happy to help my family, those in need, and enough left over to pay my bills. Maybe buy myself an old bill. But right now I can't. I travel to a tropical island. I can only see the clear blue waters in the magazine. 
Can I experience the mountains of Colorado? I can only watch the snow fall on the Rockies from my TV screen. But one day, all of this will change. Cause tomorrow knows my name. Last year was different because we were actually making a lot of money because people were actually getting a lot of financing and buying homes like crazy. But this year, people can't really get financing, so it's kind of hard. And this year, it's more hard because so far, we've been spending most of our money building a new mansion. And so far, that took up a majority of our money. All right, my name is Sherry Garay. I bought this house in 1999 with my sister. We were both single moms, and uh, it was just good timing for us to finally get a house of our own. Hi, my name is Sandy. My name is Sandy Garcia. Hi, I'm Katrina. Hi, I'm Kathy Norfolk. Hi, I'm Lisa Bacci. Hi, I'm Steve Bacci. And Annabella Bacci and Alexander Bacci. Well, right now we're we're basement dwellers. <laughs> um, taking up their basement, they were nice enough to let us come in. We had run into you know, economic problems. We spent our money you know, for the most part and it just so happened the bottom fell out. Well, my husband died. I worked for the state of Maryland for 30 years, and as soon as I could retire, I was out of there. Uh, then I decided I was gonna sell my house and move over here with my daughter because I didn't want to live alone. So that's what I did, sold my house, and here I am, and I love it. I'm playing rock band. <laughs> it's working out perfectly that we have very low overhead, but we have a lot of emotional pressure on us that has to be dealt with, and it's, it's, it, it's not cold. peaches and cream all the time. I'm glad that my friends let me stay here with, them. before it was just me when I met them and I brought along a whole family. Lots of people have to live on the streets because of overdue bills, no money, and high taxes. Please help us get back to how it was when the country was nice and perfect and people smiled. We're riding high this year, we're riding high. We got three on the bus. Crew the Pooh's been raging hard. We got our daddies in town. We got our mamas in the backyard. We got it all. One more time. No, why not? Because Mardi Gras never ends, it never stops. One more time! No, no, no! So my name's Karen Marsloff. I am the director of Seacoast Local, which is a Think Local First or Buy Local organization here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We realized that the work we had been doing in our individual communities like Portland and Worcester and Cambridge and Somerville, um, that that work would be more, even more valuable if we came up with a campaign to work together. My name is Mike Sanders. Um, this was a fish market before uh, my family bought this. Um, I think previously it was a grist mill way back a long time ago. So we've been in the neighborhood here for quite a while. When people join the Seacoast Buy Local program, it shows, like, I, I have a resource. I can go find out if I need supplies, if I want, like, um, for example, we have these polo shirts. These are done across town. My name's Steve. Uh, we do screen printing, graphic design, embroidery, mostly for a lot of local businesses, but as well as teams and um, bands and basically any group that has more than, you know, 10 people in it. And so what we want to do is get people to shift 10% of their spending in 2009, just that's a starting point, um, from non-locally owned business to locally owned business as a way to keep more money in our communities, uh, creating more revenue because that dollar recirculates more times and also creating more jobs. Subsidized story, you want me to talk and he talked. We're originally from San Diego and uh, fell in love in San Diego. Then we came out here actually and it was Joni's choice because I had dragged her so many different places. 
Uh, and uh, after going so many places, I said, you know what, honey, it's up to you. And of course, she goes, I want to go move around her, uh, her mom and her parents. And her also her grandfather was old, so she wanted to spend like the last few years around him to get, you know, so the kids could be around him and know him. And worked out perfect. Uh, and we started a business out here, and it's been super successful ever since. So she saved our family. Because I'd have stayed in Virginia, and we'd probably have swine flu right now. <laughs> With this business, now we are kicking butt. We're paying bills. I mean, I, I get the honor, because when I was in the military, Charlie took care of me. He took care of my wife when I was doing my training. You know, he helped with money and stuff, and now I'm able to employ him to help him. Hey, Charlie, so it's like this huge circle. It's a blessing. I don't know what else to say. You know, I'm, I'm a lucky man right now. It's a wonderful situation when, you know, you finally really realize you made it. It's not money. It's just the situation, you know, it's uh, being, being in, uh, in the midst of family and friends, you know, you've got a place and you can help and be helped. And it's just, it's just wonderful. I cannot tell you the value of my grandkids. It's like living a whole life over again to have these little guys to play with. Plus I never had sons and three of them are boys and that makes it fun. Put the computer in plasma. You look so out. sleepy, honey. <laughs> He's a sleepy boy. Oh, yeah. You're getting big. Like no way, my chick. I'm always just awake. They were like supposed it. to be in bed an hour ago, but. Burnt skin, dude. What? What? I'm obsessed with burnt chicken skin. Mm. I'm gonna come back and I'll make a burnt chicken skin sandwich. I'll steal all the skin off all this. <laughs> I'm assuming. Skin, skin, the meat. Huh? Skip the meat, dude. I like gonna, the, they, I they are so the, much fun to listen to talking about food diet. back there. I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna make a burnt chicken skin sandwich. Take my mother, for example. She was always be able to pay the bills easily by working one job. She was so happy and so relaxed. Now she's working two jobs. She can barely afford the minimum payment on her bills, and she's so stressed now. And the worst part is I barely get to see her. She tries hard to give me a normal life. She wants me to have fun and go on vacations. She tries to get me everything I want as a child, but I can tell that she's struggling. I know I can make it. I know I am. And um, I see that, you know, the people are willing to help if they see you helping yourself. And, um, I, you know, I have a higher power that helps me. Our lifestyle is hurried everything. And it is a detriment in our search for knowing God. How often do we spend only a few minutes with God and expect to come out shining stars or pure gold? So a meal prepared from scratch is always better than those microwaved or the fast food places. Isn't that right? This is the dough. I'll be cinnamon rolls when it's done. Cinnamon Well, Amish life is sustainable uh, and partly if you look at the actual culture and teaching is sustainable because of a term uh, I used last week here with someone called Gelassenheit. It's a German word, but it simply means that you give your meaning on something for the betterment of a group of people. We're very fortunate to have such great jobs in time of recession. If you can keep your head when all around you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, and if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you and make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not get tired of waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies and being hated, don't give in to hating and yet 
don't look too good or act too wise. And if you can dream and not make dreams the master, and if you can think and not let thoughts be the aim, and if you can meet with triumph and disaster, and treat those two impostors just the same, and if you can bear to hear the words you've spoken and see the best that you've given to something broken and yet stoop and build it up again with worn out tools. And if you can walk with kings, if you can walk with crowds and not lose your virtue, and if you can talk with kings and not lose the common touch, and if words of neither friend or foe will hurt you, and all men count with you but none too much, and if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, the earth is yours and everything that's in it. And what is more, You'll be a winner, my son. Sharon Adams and her husband, Larry, um, they're from the community. Actually, Sharon grew up in this community. Um, and she had left for, for some time, and she came back, and her community had completely changed. When I came back, not only were the trees gone, but three or four decades of disinvestment had radically changed what this community was known for. Yeah. The fact being that you got to believe in something in order to have a seed turn into something that's nourishing. In the process, it's good for my body, I feel good, and it's just enriching just to look around and see people that really want to be stewards about something better than themselves. I think with um, Obama as president right now, I think a lot of people should take advantage of that whole uh, community activist volunteer thing because it could actually really make a big difference in the world. It's like, it's one part of the community. If everybody started doing it in their communities, you can actually change the world. He's been kind of homeless around here and just playing the guitar, doing whatever he can to get money. And he had a stroke. He was picking up cans for a living, I guess, for the last few years and playing guitar at flea markets and grocery store parking lots or wherever you make some money, you know, like playing. He had a stroke back around Christmas and they put him in the hospital for about two weeks. And they put him in the rest home after he got out of the hospital. So he stayed in the rest home. I went and visited him in the rest home, and I guess, what was it, about two weeks after I visited him? It was, you visited him on Monday, on I visited Wednesday him. he broke out. Yeah, he broke out of the rest home and came, he walked to a pier. <laughs> That's one of the ones that's hanging over here. Yeah, well, you'll play a little bit, huh? 
I got, I'm thinking too much. There's something wrong with me. Yeah, uh, Spendale was originally a mill town, uh, primarily textiles and furniture, and it's a very old town. And uh, of course, with the uh, transition of uh, our textile industries and furniture industries, uh, mostly overseas, um, those plants have closed up, and, and of course, that's caused a displacement of workers. Whenever the cotton mills were running and there were jobs around here, I sold guitars for between a thousand and two thousand dollars each. Gibsons and nice fenders and really good guitars. And now that all the cotton mills are shut down, I sell guitars for five hundred dollars or less. Most of the guitars I sell brand new guitars for like seventy five dollars, but people that's about all they can afford now, you know, just not enough money. In the local economy. Hey, I got you a place for a hundred a month. Oh, really? I got you a place for the, the whole, you can have the whole use of the whole house, too. Oh, I don't need a whole house. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just an old man trying to get along, ain't I? Well, it's a, it's a proper, it's a Chinese word for, for disaster and opportunity are the same. You know, I mean, what some people see right now is a disaster uh, is an opportunity. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm Tasha Davis. And Munchy Town, I own Munchy Town Sweets and Treats in Spindale, North Carolina, 317 West Main Street, Spindale. Let's see, I decided to open the bakery when I lost my job. I was working at the Water Oak restaurant and they laid me off. And so I thought I needed to generate some monies for my family and myself. And so I decided to go with what I'm good at. And I seem to be pretty good at baking. And people seem pretty excited about having me here. The community is definitely behind it. They're very supportive. Every single person in this community is supportive. As a matter of fact, it's nice to see everyone come together, even if it's just for a small thing like a bakery. I think her baking is excellent, actually. How many times a week do you come in? Uh, I try to come at least twice a week. What's your favorite item? My favorite item is definitely the muffins. Well, I would just say, you know, for children, if you have a dream, you know, try to follow it. Try to do. It, as long as it's not too far out there, you know, it's, it, it try, try to do it. Um, and for parents, if you feel that your child really, truly has the desire, then, you know, to support them. Which cookie would I choose to change society with? I would probably have to go with peanut butter. And the reason I would go with peanut butter cookies is because they're, you know, peanut butter's nice and sticky, and you want your community to stick together. You know, to stay together, be together, that's how you grow strong. And that's just a really good, strong cookie. You want me to pick him up tomorrow and bring him down and let him yeah, make bring him, place? Yeah, bring him over. Would that be all right, Charles? Tomorrow? Yeah, yeah to come over and just take a look at it. I thought we was going today. Well, if you want to go today, we can go right now. We got to go. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we can do that, Al, and then we'll take you back to your motel. If you yeah, I'll, I'll go right now. Yeah, it's just, it's a good, uh, okay. It's a poem now. It's a poem now. We've changed it. Yeah. Okay, let's go. We know that the world is not its greatest, and we know that the economy is rough, but we also know one more thing. We know that there is hope. Hope for the world, hope for our future, hope for our lives, because as soon as the worst is over, the good times they will come. Bring happiness to our lives, because we have hope. No, I'm not scared of the future. I really am not, you know. I think, uh, think the goodness of most people will hold this country together, actually. It's, it's people's own fault. It's the bank's fault for not checking it. I mean, I guess you could say it's the government's fault for not putting guidelines in place. It, it could be anybody's fault. The bottom line is that we're here today. So what are we going to do about it moving forward? I think corruption is a big, bad thing, and that's why our government that's why our country's falling down right now, is by corruption. We've been consuming like crazy, we've been making money like crazy, and Humpty Dumpty is here. There's gonna be good out of this. It's gonna be, you know what, that phrase, we're not downsizing our company, we're right-sizing it. So right now, what needs to happen, we need to let it all crash, yes. Everybody's gonna lose a lot of money, but it'll bring everything down, back down to reality. Here's reality, and then we're all gonna have a chance to make money on the way back up again. 
for something to be reorganized, it has to be broken down, you know what I mean? So like that breaking down process, I think is what the country's going through right now, to me is fucking exciting. Now's my chance. Now's our chance to. And this time to make it right. How are you going to survive? What are you going to do to help to feed your family? What is it that you're going to find to get out there and make a difference? You feel like you bounce back? Yeah, man, that's why I'm here. I definitely think that it can bounce back. And, uh, and, and, and I guess I'd just say, you know, in the words of Winston Churchill, never, never, never give up. Everyone's trying to help the world be a better place. But everyone keeps saying it's too hard and they turn around and don't do anything about it. But I want to be one of the people who tries to set things right. If you are not in desperate need for anything and your family is safe and you can help them out and you can help out your friends at a moment's notice when they call, what else is there? Now, you fill that unforgiving minute. You, nor you, nor I, nor anyone else in the world is going to buy back one minute at a time. Oh, I think it can get worse. It depends what people decide to do, whether we make it better or people give up or, you know, there's no guarantees. There's no guarantees. There's no what it will become. It's what we will help it to become. So long as you do what you're doing is the best you can, then you're all right. That's the end of it. Thanks for your time. Sure, anytime, anytime. Can I make a you know, it's kept you Good morning, good morning, good morning. Wake up, wake up, up, up. Today is a good day. Oh, what a beautiful world. <laughs> downtown, everybody's going downtown. Everybody's going downtown. Me and Mara are gonna kick it to you very slowly. <laughs> Money, money, here comes the honey. Money, money, here comes the honey. The economy is in recession. Please don't be in deep depression. Money, money, here comes the honey. Money, money, here comes the honey. Oh. Let's 
in dreams with the snakes and the pearls as the city lights get they gather data from afar they call them ufos but i know who they are i saw them last night when i used my flashlight looking for the weed bag and pipe that took off with super fast light and never before have i felt such loss it's like they're starting again with fluid moving on mars she's an analog girl In a jar, mama's cooking on stoves under Panama's lot. She wears Colombian scars because it never goes right. And when they take her to the room, yo, they rape her out of life. In the city, turn grim, Bobby selling balloons, floating up in the clouds, wrapped and stuffed in the shoe. The nights we live in are faster than a PC. Intel beneath me, core processors up in DC. Burn the world in 30 days flat. Use the new skin to grow shrooms and feed them to your kids, 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 kids. Nothing's out of bounds for the search of fame. Cut a bump's head off if it's worth your name. A seaside to a liquid grave. I love these chemical thoughts. Drugs taught me all I need to know. Coke will turn a good, good, good girl out. In the vision of a life, she acts on repeats. Episodes on each week. Living through the glass in my TV. She's an animal. Bars. Let the moon swing swim. I'm dodging cars to keep these lungs full of wind. They could have smashed me to a billion pieces, but living in the future, I sidestep, maneuver like a cougar. She loves the way the animal feels. Fine scratching for a meal on the curb, but good, good, good man kill. All the cinema lights told the story on Broadway. Blood sucking, motherfucking heart on in a hallway. Books cover up the shame of US. The dead and gone, so who gets the baby and the duplex? Yo, for a couple of bucks, she'll back the Ku Klux Klan for standing alone, cuz, cuz, cuz.